The sin of rich people is pride and the sin of poor people is envy. If something good happened to you, although a person could be your relative or claiming to be a friend, your good fortune would make them very unhappy and if evil befell you, it would bring them great comfort. This kind of evil heartedness can be found among the rich and the poor alike. Poor people are more subject to be this way due to their poverty and ill fortune. People living like animals in the slums of Bombay, for sure suffer this type of covetousness and jealousy. Only a miracle or an extraordinary determination could possibly free a person from such a wretched life. We saw how Rehana's lot in life was transformed from the grave she lived in with her husband to the happiest days of her life spent with her lover, Jamal Khan, in the city streets and sandy beaches of Bombay. Rehana came alive and vibrant during the days of her awakening. She was fully immersed in an ocean of ecstasy, happiness and the delights of womanhood. She blossomed like a rose and the sun smiled upon her every minute of the day even though she was living and working in drudgery. Everyone around her and in the slums noticed a sudden change manifesting itself in the way she walked and in the way she talked and the very aura of just being around her. Her inner joy made her smile and talk to everybody. She began to love life. Before, she was hopeless and unhappy dealing with the sacrificial, suicidal death of her husband and carrying the heavy burden of ten mouths to feed. A new life knocked on the door of her slum after her trip to Kolaba. After her encounter with the old Saudi, her life began to change dramatically every second and every minute. Her poor, miserable neighbors noticeably felt jealous of her. Some of the women tried to find out the secrets of her happiness but they did not go further in their curiosity. If only they could get a glimpse into her world or spy out her every move. That would surely give them something to talk about but Rehana did not reveal to them the secrets of her ever-developing brand new life. One woman who was also a Muslim like her could not tolerate seeing her dressing up nice every day and leaving her slum early in the morning and returning late at night. She suspected her neighbor was having an affair. In her scandalous mind, a Muslim widow having an affair and sleeping around and not being married was the biggest sin in the world. This Muslim woman was not about to let a woman like that get away with sin and not suffer the consequences. She had to help Allah and find some supporting evidence to condemn her soul to hell and make sure it was forever. Rehana was now a marked woman and a target of vicious rumor. Once this evil rumor was concocted, she would suffer the judgment of the self-righteous, tainted minds of her neighbors and peers. Yes, the moral majority of slum dwellers was going to make sure Muslims act like Muslims should. For three days, Rehana was being followed by the self-appointed religious police and holy woman of Allah. This faithful Muslim woman followed Rehana to several of the houses she was working in. While following her, the Muslim female police of Allah did not see Rehana stopping on the way to meet or talk to any men. She concluded Rehana was having a secret affair with one of the rich men living in the houses where she worked. She could not follow her inside each house of course, nevertheless she decided to spread her unsubstantiated suspicions to anyone she could find that would listen to her. She added a few more lies to her story to make it more believable and swore by Allah she saw Rehana walking side by side holding the hand of a rich man. She asked Allah to curse her with blindness if she was telling a lie. Despite putting herself under a curse of blindness, she continued her lies saying she followed behind them down a lane as they turned off onto a narrow road. Then, she saw with her eyes the man hugging Rehana from behind and rubbing against her backside. Rehana did not stop him when he opened her blouse and grabbed both her breasts with his hands and started squeezing them. While engaged in this shameful, lustful act, they were thrusting against each other and Rehana was forced to the ground while her lover fell on top of her. Then the woman swore by Allah, may all of her children die and rot in hell that she stood and watched them do it by some trees like wild animals. This salacious dribble of juicy gossip spread like wildfire in every nook and cranny of the slums. Rehana knew nothing about the evil rumors spreading about her and continued her wonderful life with her real man. If her jealous neighbor knew about her cuddling and carrying on with Jamal Khan, she would have had a real picture of what really was going on. 
the self-appointed cop of Allah wouldn't hesitate to pay a small fortune to have someone take their photos so they could be hung on the rags of every slum. These rumors did not affect Rehana at all. They had no affect upon her until the day she was to fly to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This was the day her real troubles started. Rehana knew about the envious nature of her neighbors and she also believed in the evil eye. The evil eye is the belief that some people can bestow a curse on victims by the malevolent gaze of their magical eye. It is a look that is believed by many cultures to be able to cause injury or bad luck for the person at whom it is directed for reasons of envy or dislike. For this reason, Rehana did not tell anyone she was going to the rich country of Saudi Arabia. She did not even tell her own parents or in-laws. Just a day before her scheduled trip she went to a Muslim man, she knew who had a tea shop. She made arrangements with him to care for her family. She told him that she was flying to Saudi Arabia along with her daughter. She then said she would be sending money to her children and parents through him and she promised to pay him some commission for his services. The Muslim man accepted this responsibility and agreed to see after her family. He was surprised though how a poor widow could afford visas, tickets, and passports. This man became interested in Rehana after her husband died. He even sent someone to propose marriage to her. Rehan rejected his proposal because he was a married man and his wife was her neighbor and supposedly her friend. This woman was the secret police of Allah who spread the vicious rumors about Rehana and told everyone she was having an affair with a rich man and having sex with him out in the open like a bitch being chased by a pack of slum dogs. The husband of this Muslim woman was a somewhat knowledgeable man as compared to other men in the slums. Although he had accepted Rehana's proposal, he wanted to know how she got such a huge sum of money to buy visas, tickets, and passports. He directly told her to her face he did not believe a poor slum woman like her could possibly make that much money to afford such an expensive trip while working as a maidservant in India. Rehana simply told him the truth but he did not believe her. At first, he thought she was selling her body as a prostitute. Nonetheless, he doubted that possibility because knew a prostitute would need to sleep with hundreds of men every day for at least ten years to make that much money to cover the costs for traveling outside the country. He had some idea of how much prostitutes charged a customer for occasionally a working girl would come to his tea shop to offer her services. Whenever a prostitute showed up, he hired her to sleep with him inside the tea shop. So, he seriously doubted the possibility Rehana was able to pay for visas, tickets, and passports with money she charged for selling her body. These questions puzzled the tea shop owner so much that finally he shared this fascinating riddle with his wife. His wife had already spread rumors about Rehana that were not true and this goodie bag of perplexity added to her resentment and twisted thoughts. When the woman's husband told her about the unbelievable chance of the Muslim widow traveling to the rich Arab country of Saudi Arabia with her daughter, the woman's hate and envy reached an all-time high. She wished she could burn down Rehana's slum with her and her daughter in it to prevent them from leaving to go someplace better like a rich Arab country. The woman used to boast that her husband was alive and had a big tea shop. She looked down upon Rehana because, she killed her husband and was a maidservant working like a slave in rich people's houses. In India, if a woman's husband died while she was still living, people around her especially her in-laws and neighbors would say, she killed her husband. Hindus go further in their accusations. They burn the widowed woman alive along with the corpse of her dead husband. The evil practice of sati was considered a religious obligation. If the widow refused to practice sati she would be treated as a curse by her late husband's family. Her head would be shaved and she would be prevented from wearing shoes and colored clothing. She would be kept in a small room in the basement. Bald-headed and shoeless widow, people would not look upon her to see her face. For them to see her face was a bad omen. To examine more closely the bitterness of Rehana's neighbor, the Muslim woman's jealousy did not allow her to sleep the whole night. She stayed awake all night thinking about how to stop her neighbor from traveling to Saudi Arabia. Her treacherous plotting reached the point where she felt as if she was going to burst open. 
What troubled her the most was the fact that Rehana Khan was not going to just any rich Arab country, but she was going to the Muslim holy land where the house of Allah was. Millions of Muslims longed to visit the holy cities of Mecca and Medina and perform the Hajj rituals but for many their financial situation would not allow them to fulfill this lifelong dream. Only the very rich Muslims in India could travel to the holy cities and visit the house of Allah. The suspicious woman just as her husband, wanted to know how her neighbor obtained such a large amount of cash. She didn't think anything foolish like her husband who thought Rehana was selling her body to men. After brainstorming throughout the night the jealous woman concluded Rehana Khan had stolen the money from the rich people she was working for. When her evil mind settled upon this supposition, the self-ordained police of Prophet Muhammad conjured up exactly what she would do to stop this immoral Muslim woman from traveling to the Holy Land and House of Allah. Allah would bless her with paradise from preventing this slum dog trash from defiling the holy ground Prophet Muhammad walked on. So as soon as her husband left their middle-class slum and went to his tea shop, the evil witch put on her burqa and concealed her face and headed to the nearest police station. She told them she wanted to report a crime that had come to her attention. She claimed it was her duty as a good citizen to help stop crime in her neighborhood. She told the police inspector in charge that her neighbor had possibly murdered one of the wealthy men she worked for as a maidservant and stolen his money. At first, the police inspector did not take her complaint seriously because she was from the slums and he knew slum women to be backbiters and notorious gossipers. When she told him that the neighbor was flying that day to Saudi Arabia along with her seven-year-old daughter, he took the matter seriously and decided to investigate it. He knew if a slum woman had to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, she would not be able to afford to buy an airplane ticket to fly her from Bombay to Pune City. The police went to the slum of Rehana's family and raided it. Rehana happened to be away. At that time, she had gone to the travel agency to collect the two passports, visas, tickets, and US dollars. The police inspector returned to the station but kept two constables in front of her slum. He instructed them that as soon as the suspect returned to her slum they should apprehend her and bring her to him in ropes. In India, the police's hand and the suspect's hand would be tied together with thick long rope. I myself would prefer to fall into the hands of the ISIS or Al-Qaeda's terrorists than to fall in the hands of the police in India. When a suspect reached the detention area, the police would apply what they called third-degree interrogation methods. Waterboarding or any other kind of harsh interrogation methods utilized in the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center was nothing compared to the third-degree torture techniques of the Indian police. If the suspect happened to be a young lady, the least that would happen to her is she would be raped by at least three different police officers. Those who interrogate the suspects were called extortionists because they extract information by force. If you had not committed a crime and were accused falsely, you would be forced to admit you committed the crime. A friend of mine was held as a suspect in a drug case and was beaten, tortured, and forced to confess his involvement even though he was not guilty of a single thing. After three years of rotting inside Bombay's local jails and Pune's central prison, he was acquitted after finally being declared not guilty. He wasn't compensated at all nor did he receive an apology from the police, judge, or prosecutor. The entire court system was a sham. It's a wonder he was ever set free at all. He lost three years of his life in a dangerous bottomless pit inside those filthy dungeons. He was not able to finish his studies at the university for his body was worn and battered from being beaten day and night by the notorious Indian criminal element known as the Gandhas who hated and despised foreigners. For three weeks, Rehana Khan ascended upon high. Her life had turned over a new leaf. While searching for a better life for herself and her family, she found her benefactor, the Saudi business tycoon, Sheikh Fadiz bin Ahmed and captured the love of her life. Jamal Khan. Whether due to the evil eye or the envy of a jealous woman, her happiness was snatched from her the very same day she was to fly with her daughter to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When she returned to her slum, she saw a huge gathering of slum mires. At first, 
Rahuna thought one of her elders had died inside her slum and so she quickened her steps dragging little Ifit by the hand. When her daughter complained she picked her up and carried her in her arms and rushed to her slum. Upon arriving, the two constables standing outside arrested her and bound her hands with rope. They did not allow her to enter her slum. She tried to find out why they were tying her up but they just ignored her questions and continued to bind her with rope and hold her in custody. Her daughter began to cry out when she saw her mother being tied up. Her other children came out of their slum and tried to surround their mother but the constables kicked and pushed them away. Her parents and in-laws were helpless and unable to come to her rescue because of their old age. She heard the women who pretended to be her friends and good neighbors laughing and calling her in Hindi, thief and prostitute. In her evil frame of mind, the Muslim woman and holy woman of Allah and his messenger Muhammad who had reported her to the police shouted, You are a shame and a disgrace to all of us Muslims. Some bad boys with nothing else to do cried out, Terry Ma Ki Chut, Terry Bahan Ki Chut, Chuti Ya, Sala. Rehana wasn't arrested alone. Her little daughter was also taken into custody. When she reached the police station, she was beaten nearly to the point of death. The police seized her passports, visas, tickets, her Indian rupees and American dollars. She was forced to admit to more than ten crimes of which she had not committed. One charge she falsely admitted to was being involved in a prostitution ring and servicing Arabs nationals. She was also accused of stealing money from the household of the rich families where she was employed. The police did not believe her story that she met an old elderly man from Saudi Arabia or that he had offered her a job as a maidservant in his country. They did not believe he freely provided her with visas, tickets, rupees and foreign currency and paid for the processing of her and daughter's passports without anything in return. What complicated the matter as well was that her passport ID listed the address of a chal. Rehuna told the police the travel agency that processed her papers entered that address on her application because she did not have an address. The police knew that slum people did not have addresses but they still refused to accept her explanation for using another address. The address led the police to a second suspect. The day that Rehuna Khan collected her travel papers was the saddest day of Jamal Khan's life. He could not hide his tears when his loved one collected her papers and walked out of the office. He ran to the washroom and cried like a newborn baby. The pain building up inside him was too much to bear. He had begun to miss her even before she returned to pick up her documents. He knew it would be extremely hard for him to be without her for two long years. Jamal wanted to go to the airport but he was afraid that his boss might see him. When his boss changed his mind and decided to send the Sudanese boy instead, Jamal saw an opportunity to see his beloved one last time from afar and wave his last goodbye to her. He returned to his house and rested until 8 o'clock in the evening. Then, he dressed up and told his sister he was going to the international airport because his boss asked him to help a client traveling to Saudi Arabia. Jamal did not go more than a few meters away from his chal before three policemen stopped him. It was either a coincidence or a bad omen when the policeman asked him about the chal of Jamal Khan. He did not suspect anything and was honest and told them he was the one they were looking for. The policeman immediately grabbed his hands and tied him up. When he tried to inquire about the reason for his arrest, one of the policemen hit him repeatedly on his head with a big stick until he fell down to the ground. The same policeman forced him to his feet and told him if he asked any further questions they would beat him unconscious to make him shut up and drag his dead body to the morgue. Stunned, he decided to keep quiet as directed and went with the three policemen to the city transport vehicle. Jamal knew that Bombay police would not hesitate for a second to kill a suspect for resisting arrest. He was ordered to sit down on the floor inside the police van. He was not allowed to occupy a seat. When the vehicle sped up his body began to bounce like a rubber ball hitting against the metal seats, with his head and body banging against everything. His hands were tied behind him, which made it impossible for him to brace himself. It was in this bruised and battered state that Jamal was taken to lock up missing the last goodbye to his beloved. T.
Tears fell like a waterfall down his face when he visualized his beloved Rehana walking down the departure hall at the airport with her little daughter knowing he would not see them until after 730 days if ever again. Jamal did not know the reason for his arrest until he reached the police lockup. It was Police Inspector Guru Aurobindo Shankaracharya who applied the brutal third-degree interrogation method and extracted the same story he had received from the slum woman. Jamal admitted he filled out the applications for Rehana and her daughter and gave them his chal's address because they did not have an address living in the slum. Moreover, he told the police how Rehana got the visas, tickets, and currency. The police inspector refused to believe a single word Jamal said. He could not wrap his mind around the fact that a wealthy Arab business tycoon would spend lakhs of rupees on a slum woman and her daughter because he wanted her to come and work as a maidservant in his mansion in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. What made the story of Rehana so impossible for police inspector Guru Aurobindo Shankaracharya to believe was that he was a Hindu that absolutely despised Muslims and wanted to believe the worst about them. He once told his Hindu friends that he hated Muslims with a passion and detested the Muslim dogs and alley cats. Hence, he was intensely interested in the case of Rehana Khan and Jamal Khan because they were both Muslims. He was especially enthusiastic when Jamal dragged another cat into the fray and volunteered the name of another Muslim, his boss, Muhammad Khan. The police inspector, Guru Aurobindo Shankaracharya believed that all Indian Muslims were enemies of the Hindus and a threat to the country of Hindustan. He even believed that peace-loving, law-abiding Indian Muslims like Jamal Khan and Rehana Khan were terrorists and enemies of the Hindus. It was granted to him commission from the gods of India to root out this Muslim scrum of the earth, each and every one, and he made it his mission and personal vendetta to rid his countrymen of these cockroaches. Whenever a Muslim fell into his grasp, he would try to pin a terrorist plot on him or accuse him of being an agent of the Pakistan's ISI, Inter-Services Intelligence. If he could not establish sufficient evidence against a Muslim suspect, he would try to involve him in a drug conspiracy. In India, being charged with murder is preferable to being accused of plotting a terrorist attack or involvement in a drug crime. Accordingly, when Jamal Khan mentioned his Muslim boss, Muhammad Khan the police inspector Shankaracharya tried for two days to establish a terrorist plot before arresting the new suspect. His suspicion was increased when Jamal gave him the same name of the Saudi businessman mentioned by the first suspect, Rehana Khan. The police inspector wrote a detailed report and sent it to the Home Ministry in New Delhi. In his report, he accused a wealthy Saudi of conspiring with some Muslim Indians to carry out a terrorist attack in Bombay. The Saudi man supplied visas and tickets to a female Muslim suicide bomber to blow up an Air India plane on its way to Saudi Arabia. The Arab man probably was a member of Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula branch operating from Yemen. Police Inspector Guru Aurobindo Shankaracharya stole the visas, tickets, passports, and money of the so-called female suicide bomber the same day that she was arrested. The following day, he contacted another travel agency and sold them Rehana's passport, visa, and ticket and her daughter's documents as well. The travel agency removed the photo of Rehana and replaced it with a photo of a Malayali woman originally from South India. This woman flew to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia arriving on the third day of Rehana's original departure date claiming to be Sheikh Ahmed's maidservant. While waiting for a response from the Home Minister, the police inspector Shankaracharya put a tail on the new suspect, Muhammad by enlisting some plain clothes police officers to follow him and gather information about his daily activities. The spies followed the unsuspecting and clueless weasel when he left his office to meet his Indian mistress at their rendezvous the Oberoi Hotel. From the hotel management the police inquired about the name of the woman, where she was from and what relationship there was between her and Muhammad Khan. The information about the woman made the terrorist case a bit complicated. The woman was a Hindu named Jita Parkashtazia, a businesswoman from Bangalore City, married with a husband and four children. She was a regular guest at the hotel visiting many times with her husband, Mr. Dizia along with their children. 
The hotel management also informed the undercover officers that the woman had come alone several times and met with the Muslim man, Muhammad Khan, in her room. The nature of the business being conducted between the Hindu woman and the Muslim man was unknown. The undercover officers followed the suspect from the hotel to his house in Juhu. Although the officers cased out the area in front of the suspect's home for several hours, they did not gather any additional information about him from his friends or neighbors and they had no way of knowing what transpired between him and his wife while he was inside the residence. That night the wife of Muhammad quarreled with him throughout the night and accused him of having an affair with one of his female employees. She suspected that was the reason he was no longer interested in having sex with her anymore and for a long time. After a few hours when there was no period of activity and the suspect remained at this location, the undercover operatives concluded he would not leave again until the next morning. On following day, the secret agents came early at dawn, watched, and waited until Muhammad emerged from his family residence. They followed him from place to place to monitor his terrorist activities until he reached his base of operation. They had not come equipped with surveillance cameras or a monitored installation inside the stakeout location. If they had, they would have captured a drunk inside his office raping a defenseless and terrified young woman. Unfortunately, while the wicked, deplorable wild beast was raping and violating his young female employee, Bulbala Sheikh, Thing 1 and Thing 2 were stupidly unaware of what was happening right under their noses. They kept to their stations standing guard outside as if they were Muhammad Khan's personal security force and lookouts while he carried out his own undercover dirty work. The police inspector Shankar Acharya received the OK from the Home Ministry on Tuesday morning to go ahead and investigate the terrorist plot of the Muslim female suicide bomber. As soon as he got the green light, he rushed out to detain the last of the Indian conspirators. He was the one who toppled Muhammad off his throne, grabbed him by his left leg, and turned him upside down. When Muhammad found himself on the other end of a surprise attack, he got up and attempted to ward off his attacker with his fist aimed right for the attacker's face. If he had reached his mark, he would have been dead and gone by now. The revolver pointed at his head convinced him to concede defeat, which probably saved his life. His eight employees ran into the other part of the office where they heard all the commotion going on. They all entered about the time to see their boss hands suspended halfway above his head. They were all shocked when they saw the police inspector pointing a gun right at him. Then they witnessed the incorrigibly wicked man being bound with his hands tied behind his back with thick rope and yanked out of the office like a dangerous criminal. It was unbelievable to see for the very first time the pride and arrogance of Muhammad disappear into thin air and he became as small as a mouse in the mouth of a maimed young lion. Bulbala wished deep down in her soul the insolent violator and evil transgressor would be taken directly to the gallows and hung by his genitals. She prayed Allah would leave his soul in hell to burn for all eternity. Although police inspector Shankar Acharya did not fulfill this explicit wish of Bulbala, if she was to see what had actually been done to him that day inside the lockup, she would have seen what was inflicted upon him was worse than a hanging. Muhammad was stripped of all his clothes and left with only his skimpy playboy underwear barely covering his private parts. Then, they tied his legs with a long rope and hung him upside down. His big stomach was about to burst open and spill its contents. His bald head was just off the concrete floor. He was hanging like an animal ready to be slaughtered. Then the police inspector brought a long stick and began to hammer him with it relentlessly leaving huge red welts. Blows rained on his head, stomach, back, legs, hands, buttocks, hips, neck, shoulders, etc. No place on his body was left untouched by the extractor of information. The police inspector Shankar Acharya enjoyed nothing more than beating a Muslim that was suspected of a terrorist plot. Muhammad private parts were not spared from the rod. If he was to survive such a thorough beating, rest assured he would never have sex with his wife or any other female again. He screamed so much from the excruciating pain he lost his voice all over again which was already overworked from screaming at his employees the previous day. When Inspector Shankar Acharya felt tired of beating the Muslim terrorist suspect, he threw hot water on him. 
nearly beaten out of his mind and flung around like a rag doll, he was burned and bleeding profusely. The retribution from God was so great that all Muhammad was thinking of was that his little tryst with his female employee, Bulbala Sheikh, was maybe not so good an idea since it was evident she has reported him to the police for rape or either Sheikh Fatih bin Ahmed had telephoned the police inspector and bribed the police to arrest him concerning his missing maid servant. He never suspected he was being accused of terrorism. Not able to comprehend why or for what reason he was being tortured to death, he got the shock of his life when then the police inspector began to interrogate him about his involvement in an alleged terrorist plot. The formal charges were committing terrorist threats and treason against the country and nation of India. Now hearing for the first time the actual charges being brought against him, Muhammad knew his days were numbered.